Team Human is an ad-free, listener-supported project made possible by teammates like Sarah, Aaron, Widget, Olivia Featherston Howe, Annabeth Lane, and hopefully you. Just go to teamhuman.fm and click on support to find the others who gain access to our Discord channel, my paywalled medium posts, archives of my writing and conversations, and participation in our live Team Human salons in the Kibitz Room. See you there. You're on Team Human, Conscious Intervention in the Machine, where instead of substituting for lack of trust, we engender more of it. Humanity is not a problem to be solved, but the solution to be enacted. We can do this together. Right now, no preconditions, just trust in your humanity. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and I'm on Team Human. Playing for Team Human today, software engineer, computer scientist, and crypto skeptic Molly White. Crypto people don't even necessarily see crypto as the solution to bad code. They, they see the problem not in the bad code, but in just humans in general. You know, they, they say that anytime there's a human in the equation, you're having to trust them and they might abuse your trust. And so we should just take all humans out of the equation. The idea that pure code could solve that just seems ridiculous. Molly's going to help us determine whether Web3 really is going just great for humanity and help us figure out how much skepticism to have about the blockchain dreams of our crypto friends. It's time to intervene on our own behalf. I'm Douglas Rushkoff, and you're on Team Human. I think 2022 is going to be remembered as the year we finally saw the billionaire tech bro narrative for what it is, an insane fantasy held by adult children with too much money and too much power too early in their lives for them to do any good with it. The big threat of big tech has become the big joke practically overnight. We are watching the real-time implosion of the Silicon Valley mindset under the weight of its own hubris. Thank God I got my book done before (laughs) the unraveling began. So just hours ago, it seems, Elon Musk was considered the great threat to civic discourse by using his money and network of like-minded investors to take over Twitter. It appeared that the closest thing we had left to a public square was going to be surrendered to the whims of this would-be Trump. And most frighteningly, Musk threatened that he was going to uh, unleash thermonuclear name and shame on companies that chose to suspend their advertising on the platform. But over the course of the next few days, Musk reversed his plans and policies on a a moment-to-moment basis, first saying he'd establish a moderation council before making any major decisions, then reinstating Kanye or, or Ye and Trump, then kicking off Ye again, then lambasting Trump and supporting Rick DeSantis once Trump made it clear he wouldn't return to posting on the platform now that he was allowed to. And finally, in a last-ditch effort to stoke some excitement, he made an arrangement with some former journalists to selectively leak Twitter's prior openness to the DNC's requests to repress uh, the Hunter Biden laptop story. Now, this is a story, the Hunter Biden laptop Twitter repression suppression story was published in the mainstream media several years ago. Twitter publicly apologized, said they made a mistake. So I don't even know what the, they're leaking a story that we already read and digested and the Twitter responded to. Anyway, the man who once popularized the electronic automobile and landed rocket ships on barges. I'm talking about Musk here. He was now leaking stories about his own company to be published exclusively on his own platform as a way of generating the sort of ire and indignation that could make a a messaging app relevant again, at least among those who prefer to be outraged by media nonsense than actual human suffering. 
And for his part, Mark Zuckerberg, he undermined the future of Facebook. Remember when they were scary? He undermined the future of Facebook by going all in instead on the speculative virtual reality and blockchain hybrid known as Web3. Stock of his holding company, Meta, has since gone down by 70%. And the formerly invincible Facebook now feels a bit more like MySpace or or Friendster or, or, or Kut. Remember that? Remember when Facebook could be blamed for the outcome of a presidential election. Oh, how the mighty and scary have fallen. Meanwhile, the crypto world revealed its inadequacy as an alternative global economic system. Sam Bankman Freed, founder of mega crypto platform FTX, turns out to have staked too much of his investors' crypto on loans in his sister company, Alameda Research. And when crypto crashed, this multi-billion dollar empire imploded, taking down not only Freed and the gamblers who entrusted him with their bets, but faith in cryptocurrencies and the whole philosophy of effective altruism that Freed and his ilk were so busy peddling. Most simply, and with a little intellectual backing of long-termist Oxford philosopher William McCaskill, they believed that the damaging impact and externalities of their businesses mean a lot less in the long term than the money they can one day donate to charities with all their winnings. The ends justify the means enough for tech companies to do whatever they want as long as the founders eventually donate some of their winnings to the human cyborg future. Once a looming threat to currencies, local businesses, and the physical environment itself, crypto is now just another way of saying NFT, a fad application, but by no means the first true killer app for the blockchain, which I still have faith in, but not not crypto. It's not this stuff. The tech emperors have no clothes and no claim on our future. Something like this happened before, around the end of 1999, when AOL acquired Time Warner, revealing to anyone who cared to notice that AOL was actually just cashing in its chips after its subscriber base had peaked. The dot-com bust was soon to follow, and the internet was given a new chance to define itself as something other than a business opportunity. But after a brief flirtation with blogging and open AIs, we drifted into the social media, data mining, and fintech nightmare from which we are finally now emerging. Well, we are there again. In the coming year, we will have the opportunity to take back the net yet again. This time, let's go for something better. I am a true fan of technology thinker and writer Molly White. She's a software engineer and longtime Wikipedia editor, which is enough for her to earn, I think, our undying devotion. She's a Harvard Berkman fellow and the blogger behind Web3 is going great.com, my go to source for the straight dope on where the crypto bros are letting us down. I've been admiring her writing and speaking for a long while now and feel glad, maybe even cognitively safer, knowing she's around. Here's our conversation. So, hi, it's so great to meet you. You're just right in Brooklyn now, aren't you? No, so I was in the Boston area for a long time and now I'm a little bit further away, uh, but still in New England. Oh, uh, right. You were doing like a Harvardy thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually currently doing a Harvardy thing, but just mostly remotely. Oh, cool. The thing I don't know, I know your stuff now, but I I don't know like your origin story. <laughs> like, did you go to school for this stuff? So yeah, I went to school for computer science. I did a computer science degree, uh, and then I worked in software for six years. As you know, I was just a, basically a web developer for six years, and that was actually kind of why I got interested in the idea of Web three. Is I heard the term, and I was a web developer, and I also just really care about the web in general. And so I was like, well, I should, fi- you know, figure out what this thing is. I'd need to keep up with the industry, that type of thing. And so I started to look into it and try to figure out what the word even meant and uh, was like, 
boy, I don't know if this really makes any sense or if there is actually much behind this. It seems like a lot of marketing and hype. And so as I sort of dug into it more, I just got like fascinated with it and started to work on the project that I now run. Right. Well, it's weird. So, but like you, when I first heard Web3 as a term, it was, or maybe that was Web2, but I think it was Web3, was like Vint Cerf kind of people talking about semantic web (laughs) which was gonna be this whole i mean you mentioned that too which wasn't that gonna be somehow making everything online machine readable so like ais could do stuff there yeah definitely like when i first read about it the first thing i did was look it up on wikipedia you know i I searched web3 and what i found was the semantic web and i was like that doesn't seem like what everyone's talking about right now right and it, it turned out it's not it's completely different but people have just been using the term because you know the, the thing with web one and web two is those were i think kind of named almost after the fact when there we had already sort of had that big shift and so we needed a name for it but with web three everyone's trying to figure out what it might be you know what the future of the web might look right. like and what might be revolutionary and so it is very malleable right but it seems to me like some kind of ex post facto reverse engineered after the fact thing not like it's happened but like businesses need something to happen <laughs> they just right. had their last big growthy thing getting facebook on smartphones and chasing down our data and now it's like oh don't worry like VR and crypto and tokens and blockchain and virtual reality. These things that we don't really, web three, you know, at least web two, I understood. We're going to go meta on dot com by creating these aggregating social sites. So Facebook, for most people who don't don't remember, there used people used to have websites, but it was hard to make a website. So you went to Facebook, which kind of made a mini website for you. That you you had a home page, which kind of it was, but that's what social networks did. They were like GeoCities for kids. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. and, and it was fine. And then guys came along, Tim O'Reilly, and said, okay, web two is to web one as you know, meta is to regular. And if you want to have a business, you're gonna don't be a business, aggregate all the little businesses. Yeah. And you don't have to do any yeah, work. Platform. And you can just take a <laughs> Yeah. Which used to be used to call it being a rentier or something. Be a platform, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And then web three is trying to do that to the web two. Right, we could one more verse, same as the first, you know, a little bit louder. (laughs) So, but basically, that Web two, I understood what they were saying that you could go meta, become a meta business, become a renter, you know, buy the building, don't buy the property, you know, don't buy the apartment. But then Web three, they want to be saying that, but I don't see what it's really going meta on at all. I think it's it feels like it's almost pure pure hype language. Yeah, I mean, it's really strange. I think a lot of the Web3 projects have tried to capitalize on sort of, the f- I think there is this general feeling that uh, the ideals of the early web were not realized. You know, people viewed the web as something that would connect everybody, it would break down borders, everyone would be able to access all this knowledge, it would be this very utopian place. And, you know, I think most people view the current web, which is very dominated by a small number of large companies as, you know, not exactly the utopia that we were all envisioning. And right. Web3 proponents often latch on to that very same thing and, and talk about how we can move on from, you know, all of these small or uh, these few large tech companies and, you know, the extraction of user data for profit and all these different things. And you can own your own data and the web will be democratized and all these things, which sound very good and like good goals. But then you actually look at the projects that are being created and the, the ways that they are trying to achieve this. And it looks like the same thing all over again, where there are the same big venture capitalists backing these projects. There are the same data silos that are developing And there's just more obfuscation around what exactly is happening. And so they sort of come up with these ways that you sort of own your data, but it's still very extractive. It's still being monetized. It's like a new coat of paint on the same old thing. Yeah. And it's weird. You know, so I read like in the, not even the early, but the middle blockchain days, there are like books 
like uh, George Gilder wrote this book, Life After Google, that I even made my students read it. And he was basically saying, look at Google and Facebook and all those Amazon, these big centralized monopoly corporations. You know, he sounds in the first half of his book like Cory Doctorow or someone we would love saying these are big extractive things and they, you know, you can't escape from them once you're in them. There are all these choke points. It's like, great. But then he's like, but the blockchain's going to come along and totally decentralize everything and you know you'll you'll own everything and it's all good and 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 i re- i remembered that was what the early internet sounded like pre-wired even you know we're mm-hmm. all going to own everything everyone's going to be collect connected any idea any butterfly can flap its wings leading to a hurricane somewhere else we'll get a true <laughs> decentralized thing But then, and you wrote this piece like last November, I guess, where you looked at the web, at the, at the so-called web three, the promise of it. And you found, I made the list, you found play to earn games, which is basically a rentier class with employees. It's not even individual kids earning money. You've got to join a team that someone else is paying for Uh, new kinds of DRM, which is digital rights management, NFT sites with fake art. You found censorship resistant social networks that were basically spam and and worse. Spam, I would welcome spam at this point compared to some of what's there. <laughs> um, bad right. investments, stablecoin, which for people don't who don't know what that, it's like a, a money market fund that's based in nothing in synthetic nothings. People try to store their money in because it's supposed to be stable, but they crash. And exchange crashes. So that was, you know, <laughs> that, that was the industry you found. I mean, did you find it's kind of anybody doing the cool stuff, you know, it's like weird <laughs> Europeans, like imagining new forms of government or something or. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the government thing was really interesting to me, actually, in particular, because I was really uh, intrigued when I heard people starting to talk about DAOs and how there could be these communities that were self-governing. And I was like, that sounds great. You know, it sounded like a co-op almost, or everyone had sort of ownership in whatever endeavor was being pursued. And so I started looking into that and those turned it up, turned out to be kind of a disaster too, because the DAO governance is all based on token allocation. And so you get the same number of votes as you have tokens, which means that whoever holds the most tokens, aka the wealthiest person in the project, gets the most votes. Yeah, that's weird. Isn't that kind of how proof of stake works too? I mean, I know we move proof of work is bad because it's just like burn, let's burn stuff to prove we love our coin. And proof of stake, I got it, was like, I think the idea is that whoever has a whole lot of coin has a stake in the ledger being kept properly because they've got a lot of coin. But doesn't that mean then that whoever has the most coin gets the most service fees? Yes. Right. (laughs) Yeah. It's a rich get richer type of thing. It is, right? I mean- that doesn't, yeah, why doesn't anybody to... say that? That I I keep <laughs> thinking that and then ask like people who have those proof of stake coins and they go, oh, no, 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 you don't understand how it works. Yeah. Well, a lot of this <laughs> stuff is like the people, you'll, you'll point out things like that to people who are working on these projects and they'll say, oh, yeah, 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 but we're working on it. We'll fix that. You know, that's something we can overcome. And a lot of the times that never actually happens. You know, they just sort of say, eventually we'll get to that and we'll fix that. But in the meantime, people get enormously wealthy and the power gets centralized in these, you know, individual entities. The other thing too, is that when you start out with a flawed system and then you have to start band-aiding all of these flaws, you know, you're sort of starting from a disadvantage there rather than starting with a system that might actually be well designed in the first place and that wouldn't have those inherent flaws that you then have to sort of tape over so yeah it's a very odd sort of situation with with crypto right now and it does in a lot of ways incentivize and reward those who already have the most right which is what it was invented to stop Right. So pretty good privacy, which I loved. Right. Which is basically the original my my first exposure to keys and public and private keys and all that was like, oh, this is cool. We have a there's a need here, which is to have end to end kind of encrypted, verified communication. This guy came up with a really cool way to do that. And now we can use it. Or like Tor networks. I'm like, okay, that's cool, because now we have this way to have 
a bunch of resources and stuff not sitting on a central server so the bad guys can't take it away. Oh, good. I see a reason for that. And even early Bitcoin as a thought experiment, it's like we've got Occupy Wall Street and we're angry at the big banks and all. And this guy's like, oh, you know, you could combine those two technologies to sort of authenticate transactions between people and then stack them up in a ledger and you don't need the banks. It was like, oh, that's cool. But then it's like before it's even hatched, it becomes this investment thing. Everybody's turning it into the it's like the old paradigm kind of just dominated this new tech before it was even tweaked. Yeah. And now we have crypto banks. <laughs> it's like the big banks, just their crypto, you know. And so you sort of have the same, you know, they've basically reinvented a lot of the financial system in crypto. So yeah, I mean, I, I definitely sort of see what you're saying. You know, a lot of the stated goals of crypto are actually very interesting and, in my opinion, worthwhile. You yeah. know, they talk about decentralization. They talk about censorship resistance, you know, democratization of wealth. All of that's great. You know, I, I love all that stuff. And I think a lot of people who who find who are in crypto and look at people who are skeptical of crypto, they just say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you hate decentralization. I can't believe you hate, you know, banking the unbanked and democratizing wealth. And it's like, no, 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 no. I don't have any issue with the stated goals. The issue I have is with the the way that you've chosen to try to go about these stated goals, which is generally not accomplishing them very well. I know. Right. You look at a story like, you know, FTX or San Bagman Freed, that's not the exception. That's kind of the rule. You know, it feels right. like all of these things, I mean, I'm sure, you know, whatever, Coindesk or one of these, well, Coinbase probably is not, you know, leveraged up to the eyeballs. You know, those guys have a, I would hope, you know, as a, as an exchange, as a... <laughs> That's the thing, though. It's like we don't you really don't know. You know, most people would have said with FTX, oh, I, they can't be, you know, leveraged up like that. You know, they're talking to the SEC all the time and they're pushing for responsible regulation. I'm sure they would never do something as absurd as Sam bankman fried just did. And then what do you know? You know, that's exactly what happened. And because there is so little transparency in the industry, it's very hard for normal people, you know, to actually you know, evaluate which of these platforms they can trust to store their crypto or to, you know, do their exchanges or to earn yield or whatever it is that they're trying to do. Right. There's no SIPC or whatever it is, you know, or real, a real like E-Trade or Charles Schwab. You, they belong to this thing, the SIPC, which is sort of like a private version of the, of the FDIC. It's you buy a hundred shares of GE, at E-Trade. E-Trade can go out of business. Your 100 shares are still there. And there's like a an SEC or a, there's like regulators who make sure they're not going to sell your, I guess they, sometimes they do. They, sometimes these places, if you don't get your share certificates, they can lend them <laughs> and there's ETFs and synthetic things. They kind of do nasty things, but at least there's rules with crypto. It's like none of the regulars understand crypto well enough to even make rules about it. Yeah, to some extent. But I think also a lot of it is just a lack of willingness to enforce existing rules. You know, the for example, SEC regulations are intentionally very broad because it's very, you know, it's it's not a great idea to write super, super specific regulations because then people can just come up with new things all the time to sort of find the loophole. Right. So they write the regulations very broadly, and then they're able to interpret them and apply them as needed. And and that is actually what the SEC has done in some cases when they've gone after various individual platforms or whatever it might be. But by and large, they're not really enforcing the regulations that do exist. And they have enabled this industry to say, oh, you know, we're not clear on who is responsible for regulating us. And so, you know, we're not a security, you know, we don't have to comply with all this stuff, even though, you know, there's a pretty good argument to be made that they do. Yeah. And I feel guilty sometimes when people like this one, this model came to me with this idea. I think she went and did it for a, it was a, a, a crypto NFT thing. So her fans can buy NFTs and that makes them voting members of this big community. And the money that they're using from the 
buying of the NFTs and the increase in value of the token is going to be used to buy land. And then everyone gets to go stay in a sustainable eco village together and be all happy. And I feel like the asshole when I say, this isn't going to work. You're going to bring all your little fans into a, into a pyramid scheme that's going to fail. <laughs> and don't you feel bad though, a little bit being like, I, don't, I mean, I'm sure people come to you with these ideas all the time. To some extent, I think some people probably know better than <laughs> to sort of try to pitch me on their crypto plans. But um, yeah, I mean, I they do. And, and my response is usually the same, which is that like, if you want to have, you know, if you're a model or a pop star or whatever, and you want to have a fan community and there's a collectible that the community members buy and, you know, through buying it, they get a space in your, you know, online platform or your eco paradise or whatever. Like, you know, why not just do that? Why do you need the NFT? Why do you need the blockchain? Right. And once people start trying to answer that question, that's when things sort of fall apart a little bit. They do. <laughs> you know, when, when someone tries to explain you know, you say, well, well, you know, why do you need the blockchain? It's usually like, well, because then people will give me money. And it's like, right. yes, that's, you know, this endless income, this endless source of money that you are relying upon is basically an endless stream of greater fools who will buy your NFTs. And if they go away, then your project won't succeed because you won't have this endless stream of income. And when that happens, the people who suffer are the, the last fools in line who bought the NFTs that were very expensive and are now worth nothing. And this happens over and over and over again. As well as you, because your name yeah. is on the top of the thing. You right. Know, as, your the, as the name on the scam, you know, and they, without realizing it's a scam. And it's, it was a ton of these movie people were doing that too. A, a lot of movie producers were calling me saying, oh, so we've got this new way. Even Coppola's son, Francis Ford Coppola, Godfather guy's son, started a, the mm -hmm. first NFT-based movie company where people buy it. And the interviewers kept asking, well, why the NFT? What is that? And then finally, somewhere way down in the interview, he says, well, because people are more likely to invest. It creates excitement around the project. Yeah. It's like, okay, so basically you may, to create excitement around a project is that's the literally the scam. That's the sugar. That's the drug on it. Yeah. I mean, they, basically a lot of the arguments behind, especially with NFTs, because NFTs experience such a huge uh, hype sort of explosion in 2021, a lot of the argument behind all of these groups and companies that were doing NFTs was people really like them and there's a lot of money in NFTs right now, which is great while the money's there, but it's a speculative bubble. We saw in, you know, with the benefit of hindsight that it was a speculative bubble. And so, you know, you are basically saying we need to cash in on the speculative bubble while the getting is good, which is like, that's fine. If you want to, you know, if something's really popular and you want to get in on it for that reason, go for it. But don't tell me that that is why it's the future of the web or the future of society or revolutionary right. technology. Right. You know, it, just because exactly. people are buying it a lot. <laughs> right. It's like, if you find out that, you know, you put the word red in your movie title and more people are going to go, fine. Gig is it. Put the word red in your movie title, sell more tickets, but this is a, a little different. The, the other thing I don't understand is that the smarter people about this seem dumber about it too. So like you look at the, the Winklebrus guys, the, the Winkle people from, from Facebook. So they have Gemini, which is like this, mm -hmm. in theory, legitimate platform, you know, as legitimate as the platforms get, right? It's one of the right. things. And Sam Bankman's thing, FTX crashes, and we know because it was undercapitalized and they were doing all that. But then I see an article like last week that says Gemini has halted withdrawals on its lending platform because of something to do with FTX. And I don't yeah. even, I don't understand what that even means. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens in these crypto crashes is that the whole industry is so tightly knotted together and everyone is lending money to each other and borrowing money from each other. And so when a big player in the space like FTX explodes, it has this enormous contagion effect on the rest of the industry where, I mean, it is really devastating watching all these dominoes fall. We saw it earlier in the spring with Terra Luna. We saw it again with Three Arrows Capital. 
Uh, and then now we're seeing it with FTX. And what happened with Gemini in particular is Gemini wasn't even directly exposed to FTX as far as I know, but a company called Genesis was partnered with FTX and because they had to suspend their withdrawals and their sort of lending program and Gemini used Genesis as a partner for their lending program, then they had to suspend withdrawals. And then all of these retail customers who didn't even know that they had exposure to FTX, who were just using Gemini and thinking it was totally legit and totally fine and not this offshore exchange FTX, it's Gemini, you know, it's totally legit. Now they're up a creek because they can't withdraw their money anymore. And, and they didn't even know. I know it's not. So then it's back to, oh, maybe I should have kept my, my freaking wallet on that. I've, I got a hard drive somewhere here where I used to have, <laughs> I had uh, at the early days, I had ether on a, on a wallet, on a hard drive, you know, yeah. I actually in the old, old days, I went to, um, to a bank, a big, one of the famous, you know, like, uh, uh banks because they were just getting involved in crypto and I went in for this is back when you would go live to places back in the pre COVID days. And they took me down to a vault and they had laptops in a cabinet in a vault <laughs> that was their crypto holdings. And I was like, uh-huh. I-, I don't know if that's good or I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> Just like get some tech person. They're like calling me. I was like, get a real tech person in here. I mean, I think there's <laughs> probably things like drives or servers yeah. or things you could have that are better than these, you know, Dell laptops sitting in a in a metal shelf. You know, it's yeah. each one with a million dollars of Bitcoin on it. Like this couldn't be this couldn't be right. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's sort of the weird choice that people have to make these days. They have to either try to self-custody their coins, which is what crypto people say is the right thing to do. You know, not your keys, not your coins. You shouldn't be using these exchanges. You should have your, you know, little hardware wallet and yeah. you store it, you know, in a vault, you know, a safe somewhere or whatever. Or, you know, you use something like FTX or, you know, any of these other sort of crypto banks, crypto exchanges to store your coins and in some cases earn yield off of them. That's why they're partly why they're so attractive. And it's really easy to use FTX or Coinbase or Celsius or Voyager. It's it's easy. It's not so easy to self-custody your co- you know your crypto. You have right. to sort of know the actual technological process of, you know, moving it around and like actually being able to spend your crypto that's on a hard drive is like very difficult for a lot of people to grasp and understand how to do that. And then you also have to not lose it. You know, you have to make sure the drive doesn't get corrupted. You have to remember your secret keys. And then so we see all these people who end up trying to do what they thought was the safe thing. And then they lose their secret keys or they forget them or whatever it is. You know, there's that one guy who's still digging through a landfill yeah, somewhere because he threw. Well, he's got yeah. like two billion dollars or something on a hard drive that's in a waste. He dump. thinks, yeah, <laughs> yeah, assuming he can find it and it's not corroded and all that, you know. And so it's like you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place here, where there is no like easy way to store your crypto. It's not user friendly to to self custody it, and so people end up doing the obvious thing, which is using FTX and and things like that. And then they end up totally screwed. Yeah. I think there's also malfeasance going on. I mean, not to say anything bad about anybody, but you know, there's this other exchange, Binance. And they're like, I felt like they were being a little bit like Elon Musk when he first was going to buy Twitter and then decided kind of he didn't want to. So they like Binance says, oh, don't worry, we're going to help you out. We all help each other out. You know, it's OK. We'll just buy you. And then they're like, oh, screw that. We <laughs> we popped a hood. That's scary stuff. We're pulling yeah. everything. And then it go crashes. And I'm thinking, and who benefits from that? You know, I guess Binance gets all the if there's the last man standing. Well, and even before the the offer to rescue FTX, Binance is actually kind of what kicked off the whole collapse in the first place because CZ, who's the CEO of Binance, threatened on Twitter to sell a lot of these FTT tokens that Binance still held after FTX bought out their stake in the company. 
And that's what really triggered the bank run, you know, between that and a leaked balance sheet from Alameda that was published by Coindesk. You know, those two things really sowed the seeds of fear in FTX customers, which triggered both the sell off of FTX or sorry, FTT, which is the FTX token and a run on the bank. And so it was really that tweet, I think, that that really started the whole thing. And then CZ sort of like offered a lifeboat and then took it away and then the whole thing went up in flames. But yeah, it's hard to know, you know, how much, you know, some people sort of see CZ as this like absolute Machiavellian mastermind uh-huh. who's five steps ahead of everybody else. And he, you know, they they think he knew that Alameda and FTX had been doing all this shady stuff and that there was, you know, they were really heavily dependent on this FTT token. And so he decided to like poke a hole in FTX and watch it all explode. That could be like, I don't know any more right. than anyone else or on it that. It could be the other way too, because you do see Binance has bailed out a bunch of these. A lot of them bail out other players you know, or lend them a ton of money to do it just because they're like, they're all depending on the credibility of the world. So if Binance can prevent the lack of faith in one crypto venture, it helps their business too. Right. You know? Yeah. And that's partly why I sort of question the the sort of the evil one. CZ right. as evil genius yeah. theory, because assuming he was this absolute mastermind who, you know, uh, coordinated the whole collapse of FTX, then he probably also would have been smart enough to know that that collapse would have enormous negative ramifications on the crypto industry, right. which would then affect finance. So, right. you know, it's, yeah, it's it's a little hard for me to to play that one out in my head. But who who really knows? No, it doesn't make <laughs> sense. But what it exposes, though, and I keep trying to explain to people that I get that our U.S. dollars and pounds and whatever. It's all fiat currency. It's not based in gold and all that. And they go, well, that dollars are fiat currency and Bitcoin's fiat currency. It's all, you know, or it, it's invent. There's nothing there, you know, federal reserve. And I'm like, yeah, but the U S dollar, at least you're going to pay your taxes with it. Everyone's right. going to have to convert to dollars at some point in order to keep this giant government alive. No one has any reason they're going to have to convert to Bitcoin or Ethereum or something else. So that these they they end up being these kind of faith based commodities, not commodity commodities. Right. So you can do something. You say something wrong. I mean, I could hack any blockchain, no matter how secure it is, by hacking the psychology of the people who have its tokens. Right. That's the easy. Right. The social yeah, <laughs> social hack. Exactly. You know, you're you're basically investing in the book. You know, the you're 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 putting money behind your faith that everyone else will keep the faith. <laughs> right. And that is such a difficult thing to try to do responsibly. And people have all these charts and they have all these algorithms and these theories. And, but in the end of the day, you know, it all just sort of, you, you just sort of are along for the ride and you can get really, really burned from it. And I think people often don't realize quite how volatile and risky these currencies are. You know, people here, I, I hear this a lot where I'll mention that a cryptocurrency is really volatile and people will go, well, so is the stock market, you know, yeah. or so is so is some other investment vehicle. And it's like, sure, there is risk when you are buying a stock and you're investing in the stock market, but it's like orders of magnitude different <laughs> from the risk that you are taking on when it comes to cryptocurrency. Like you can say that two things are risky, you know, like driving in your car is risky and jumping off a bridge is risky. <laughs> yeah. Right. The, those two are both true, true statements, but they're also very, very different levels of risk. And so I think people don't always grasp that with cryptocurrency They, you know, they hear that it's risky and they go, okay, well, I'm willing to take on some risk and, in hopes of returns, you know, I I can do that, and and they don't realize exactly what what that actually entails. Yeah, and even you know beyond them. So I get that there's this giant community of people who just think of of crypto like meme stocks or something. You know, just these mm. jump in Ponzi tulip whatever. I just want to get in on it. Fair enough. You want to get in on it? Yeah. Go for more it. More power to them. Get in opinion. on it, right? Get their polka dot <laughs> token and see what happens. I'm all you're yay. But then there's the people, the ones, the ones that I'm almost more intrigued by are the kind of the more the techno solutionists who say Mm -hmm. we can write up the problem with society is bad programming. So we're going to rewrite the program 
in a different egalitarian, decentralized, blockchain-y way and solve for crime, solve for racism, solve for... And I mean, you even wrote about how crypto could be good for like, if you got to get out of Iran before the dictator catches you, there's, there's useful, there's use cases for it, right? But are there... I feel like the, the 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 inability of crypto to solve so many problems has undermined a lot of people, including my own faith in techno solutionism, in that kind of mm-hmm. Bucky Fuller idea that we just gotta, you know, redesign society with better code and it will all happen. I mean, where where do you feel about that? Do you feel like we could we could kind of re engineer this thing to to serve people better? Yeah, I mean, it's really weird because I feel like a lot of times Crypto people don't even necessarily see crypto as a solution to bad code. They they see the problem not in the bad code, but in just humans in general. You know, they they say that anytime there's a human in the equation, you're having to trust them and they might abuse your trust. And so we should just take all humans out of the equation and replace them with code. And these smart contracts can do everything. You don't have to trust anybody. And First of all, my my general agreement is that a lot of problems do come down to humans, right? You know, most problems, when you get to the real root of them, there's a human involved and, and that's sort of the, the root of it. Yeah. But I don't agree that most problems can be solved with code, right? Like code can be a part of solutions in some cases. And if, you know, if your problem is fairly simple, I would say, uh, as many problems are, then, then code can be a very good solution. But when your problem is something like money is broken <laughs> yeah. or, you know, society is broken because we have to trust people or systems or governance are broken, the idea that pure code could solve that just seems ridiculous, especially because they sort of seem to have this idea of code as something that just falls from the sky, beautifully, fully formed, you know, immaculate, never needs to be touched again, and it can just be deployed, and then we will all live our happy lives with that code running everything. And anyone who's ever written software knows that that is an absolute fallacy. It's not possible. You know, you cannot write perfect code. Even adding two numbers in software is hard sometimes, right? And so there will always be people involved because there always need to be people who can maintain the code or who maintain the, you know, the hardware on which the code is running or, you know, who, who keep these projects organized in some way, there is really no way to just sort of transcend people in the way that people are saying. Isn't there like, I mean, this is an aside, but aren't there like things that have COBOL in them somewhere that they made (laughs) like in the seventies that are just running and no one knows how they work anymore. And we just live on them. Like, like the space lab, do they know how to still program that? Isn't I guess someone still I mean, there, knows. Yeah, there there are still COBOL <laughs> programmers around. Uh, God bless them. And uh, you know, and I think a lot of the problems that people identify actually with this, with legacy banking systems, they blame on those old systems that have been running for a very long time. And it's like, yeah, because you know they could actually probably be improved at this point. You know, because code is not meant to live forever and run forever untouched undisturbed by you know human intervention but they sort of it's like they sort of envision these two worlds where somehow everything is broken in the code in this world but everything will be beautiful and perfect in their world well because we'll have ai that will fix the code (laughs) and continue to iterate the code based on whatever original parameter we set you know so you're going to end up with these like you know skinny bankrupt humans with perfect teeth or whatever you know the original (laughs) algorithm person put in there right because they they iterated it to that to that extent without even thinking about second order effects much less third order fourth order effects you know and they're all systems theorists they all call themselves systems theorists and nobody's looking at second order effects i would have i've got my system i've got a stack i got a stack of blockchains one for water (laughs) one for energy one for education one for 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 sexual liberties and gender definition and one for you know government and these are perfect and they're going to iterate themselves based on how well humans are doing yeah i mean <laughs> 
Well, so I, I point out once in a while that crypto seems to rebrand itself every couple of years. You know, first it was Bitcoin and then people started to associate Bitcoin with like the Silk Road and, right. you know, but people buying drugs online. And so they were like, OK, no, well, we won't use Bitcoin anymore. It's crypto or right. it's blockchain. And then people kind of got bored of crypto and blockchain, especially around the ICO era. And so then it's Web3, you know, and all these different things. And so people are like, so what's the next one going to be? Like, what's the next hype cycle that gets, you know, billions of dollars of VC and invest investments? And I am so worried that it's going to be like AI meets blockchain, because those are two things that independently have just enormous hype cycles behind them. And, yep. and like the, it feels like yeah. they would merge into the mega hype monster. They would have to. <laughs> VR, it's so hard for them to hype VR because we experience it. So it's like, yeah. oh, okay, well, it's a little better than porn maybe. But, you know, <laughs> what's, what's the application here really? is what's, what's the reason for this migraine? You know, it's like, okay, right. forget it. But with, you know, AI is is out there somewhere. Like the blockchain is out there. So it could be – right. And I think actually that's something that has been really beneficial to to the crypto industry is that people have a really hard time sort of picturing it and they see it. A lot of people will see crypto and blockchains as very, very technologically complex, way out of their realm of understanding. You know, I, I could not possibly be smart enough to understand how blockchains work. And so they assign kind of this mystique to them where it's right. like, well, someone smart thinks that they're the future of finance. And so I should probably put my money into this when they could actually probably understand at least the bits that they need to know <laughs> right. to get kind of an understanding of what's going on and, and what people are trying to do with their money. But the fact that people have been you know, willing to buy this explanation that it's so complex and that it, you can't possibly understand it, which is something that the crypto industry has absolutely you know, nourished. They nourished. Have, they've absolutely, yeah. you know, fed that um that particular belief uh to their own advantage you know then people will put money into this and just be like well now the computers are going to make me money yeah. and and they sort of don't they don't question yeah. it any further well, that's and that's something I, I've to be honest, in the '90s when we needed money, we would tell, "Oh, HTML. Oh, don't even, don't even try. It's really hard. I'm gonna, be, you yeah. know, all we do is like a href, you know, and ITAL, yeah. and and maybe I could do frames, right? But it was enough to scare people, like, oh no, you can't, whatever. You let me program your. I remember Excel spreadsheets. You know, oh, I'll mm -hmm. build your template. Don't worry, you know, you don't try to use those little symbols at all. You build a, you know, a template for them." <laughs> And uh, we all, dip, I mean, our career to careers, as such as they were, our our pay depended on maintaining our clients' relative ignorance about how yeah. this stuff worked. So that's an old, it's an old technique. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> but it, I mean, I think the fact that people are still willing to play along with it in crypto is a little bit upsetting, especially when some of those people are, you know, venture capital firms that should be doing due diligence, you right. know, and, and people who really should know better. Yeah, you would think. I mean, the, the thing that was most interesting to me about what you were talking about was the way that crypto solutions and techno solutionists in general look to substitute for human trust rather than engender it. And mm. what I've been trying to imagine is, aren't there ways we could deploy technology that are not just pro-social, but pro-trust? In other words, what would it look like to build a digital currency that engendered and promoted and encouraged trust between people? I mean, and is there such a thing or is it always sort of like, you know, one or the other? No, I think you're absolutely exactly right there. And that's that's something I really try to focus on. It, it, I think that's why I, I hear people a lot say they try to argue that like crypto isn't political. Technology isn't political. This is just a technology. You know, there's there's nothing more than that. But when you actually look at it, you know, people are coming at the same problems and they're, they're coming to very different solutions. You know, the, the problem is you know, a, a problem is that, you know, trust has sort of broken down in our society, right? Like people don't trust strangers on the street. They don't trust their government. They don't trust scientists, you know, whoever it might be. That I think most people can probably agree on, yeah. <laughs> right? 
But people have very different approaches to solving that problem. You know, like it sounds like you and I both look at that and go, oh, my gosh, you know, that's that's not good. (laughs) We should figure out how to, you know, form a society where people can trust each other and where, you know, there is a community where people are actually, you know, feeling safe and supported and where they can actually put trust into other human beings. And other people look at that problem and they go, fine, no trust. We'll remove all trust. You know, there should not be any uh, places where you have to depend on another person and we will all become these very individualist, every man for himself beings that just depend on code to do all this financial wizardry so that we can each try to maintain our own horde of tokens or whatever it is and then you know we'll go from there and then everyone can allocate their tokens in their you know purest libertarian ways to support whatever it is they think they want to do and if you don't have tokens you know too bad there is undeniably a political bent to that right like you can't say that there is no political right strident ayn rand individualist libertarian So you know, I, I think it's really bizarre when people say, oh, crypto is not political. It's just a, it's just the technology. And you, you go, oh, well, look at where it came from and what it's trying to do. You know, I, I don't actually think you can really make that argument. But that is what it comes down to. I think a lot of times it's just a totally different approach to problem solving. Right. Right. And it's odd, though. So, I mean, you're a computer scientist, basically, but where you're you're focus is kind of no longer in code so much as I guess the interface between code and human society. Yeah, right. It's it's actually funny, like a lot of journalists or whatever will, will say like, oh, you're a computer scientist, you come at this from a very technological standpoint. But if you look at my writing, I actually don't really go at yeah. it from a technological standpoint, partly because the techno, you know, the actual technology is not really the most interesting piece of it. It's interesting, yeah. but it, I don't actually think it's that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you know, what people are trying to do with it and the problems they're trying to solve and, and how they're solving them. I think that's the more interesting piece. And so I don't actually really draw on my computer science background all that much when I'm doing this, because again, it just doesn't feel like the most critical part. You know, I can if I need to, but I don't typically need to. I much prefer to actually look at, you know, what are the problems people are trying to solve? Why are they trying to solve them that way? What, you know, what is the purpose of the the blockchain that they're introducing to it, you know, how has that actually worked or how does it look like it might work? Because that's really the interesting piece of it. Yeah. And your, and your public work, you know, web three is going, web three is going just great.com in case you don't remember it. Web three is going great.com is, is this public service. I mean, it's, it's tongue in cheek in part, but it's really just saying, all right, here's what happened here. Here's what happened there. This is kind of goofy, but here's what they're trying to do over here, which is, it's this terrific project in that it's great. Well, I feel like I'm the target audience for it because I know (laughs) a little bit, but not a lot. And it's like, it's like, oh, that's why that was so stupid. I thought that was stupid, but now I can (laughs) see why it's stupid. You know, it's like the only other person I know who writes as well as you do about this is um, Philip Rosedale. The guy who started Second Life, he'll sometimes write, like, he's like, oh, look, Elon Musk, by buying a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin, just undid 18 years worth of environmental savings of the entire Tesla company. (laughs) You know, and he'll do the math and he'll show it there. And it's just like, oh, I get it. I, I I see what happened there. So it's 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 beautiful for us. I'm wondering, though, what are you hoping for now? What are you kind of working on? What's your, your, if you can share, kind of... What's your either your techno techno or social kind of project or goal? Yeah, so I'm I mean partly I'm just continuing that project, you know, as long as I feel like it serves a purpose, which so far it continues it to feel like it does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's definitely a large portion of my time, but I think just trying to you know, educate as much as I can on a lot of this stuff, you know, help people like understand that this is actually something you can understand. You know, you you should not buy into the the idea that this is all too complicated for you, you know, and, you know, actually try to influence how we as, you know, a society, as govern- governments, as uh, tech companies decide to engage with this industry, because it does feel important, you know, and like we're at kind of a crossroads on that point. 
but beyond that, you know, I, I maintain this, despite my cynicism, which I sort of display in a lot of ways. You have $3 million invested in a basket of crypto coins. And a, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I'm buying the bottom here. Uh, no, I, uh, so despite my sort of cynicism, I, I remain very optimistic about the web in general. Like, I think I still believe in a lot of those very utopian dreams. Mm. And so I've been trying to focus a little bit more recently on, you know, how could we go about achieving those things that would actually be really great, you know, like self-governing communities, how can those operate more uh, robustly online, you know, are these crypto people onto something with the DAOs, or maybe is there something else that we could look into, like online co-ops or whatever it might be. So I'm, I'm starting to do some work into that. Partly because I just have such a strong interest in online communities, all sort of working towards shared goals. You know, that's something I've sort of been a part of for a really long time as, as someone who's been a part of the media community for a long time. And I see a lot of people out there saying, how can we make this sort of Wikimedia-like community to, to do right. something, whatever it is, you know, to moderate Twitter or to, you know, do whatever it might be. And, and people are asking that question a lot. And the answer is very unclear. Even Wikimedians are like, we don't know how this all works. I know. I was asking Catherine Mayer, the, the, from, uh, she was like CEO of Wikimedia for yeah. a while. I was like, okay, okay, great. This was great. How do we apply this to, I was talking about how do we, can we apply it to uh, equitable enterprise? You know, mm. what would be the, how do you create a business that would use those? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think, I mean, I don't think anyone does. Uh, right. And so I'm trying, you know, one thing that has been really interesting to me is like, why does it work? And why can't it be replicated or could right. it, you know, and what is it that makes it repl replicable or not? You know, I, I think it's an interesting question. And and I would argue it was there was such kind of a momentum, a positive inertia created by the human drive. You know, there were humans yeah. who had a common interest that were go and that has a force to it. Right. You know, and then I think you I think lose. so. Yeah. You lose if you don't understand the tech or you're intimidated, then you lose that. But I find that so incredibly inspiring to just right. like and 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 optimistic to say that okay, so a group of humans can come together with a shared goal and make incredible things using the technology that is the web. You know, that to me is like amazing. How can we yeah. nurture that elsewhere in the web? And so I've been trying to sort of just examine that to some extent and figure out why have, you know, other communities not been doing the same thing or where have they been doing the same thing in often smaller and less well-known ways. I'll tell um, you, before you were alive, <laughs> I would get, we did it on the web. It was what the web was. You just made right. your page. You know, I made a little Astro Boy page was my page and I got a few articles and it was easy. And it was like, yeah. I kept trying to argue back then in my articles, look, you're making it easier, but you're also making it harder. In other words, mm -hmm. learning basic HTML is not such a barrier to entry. It's not as hard as learning the alphabet was or how to <laughs> read and write. I mean, this is easy. It's going to take a couple of hours, but then we're all going to have all this power and all be able to make it. And everyone opted for their friggin', you know, AOL and, and Facebook Insta cookie cutter pages. Cause you could just fill in your, I like these books. I like these movies. And then you're there. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but that's something that gone. really, that's something that really fascinates me. Cause I, I hear people saying that kind of thing a lot where there's like this nostalgia for the early mm. web where it was the, you know, this utopia and, and, you know, we ruined it and, and it's gone and those things don't exist <laughs> anymore. And it's like, well, why can't we move the web in that direction in some way? You know, why, why can't, can't we, we, why can't we, change we can. the, yeah. And so we I can. think, it, I think it really comes down honestly, just to incentives, right? Like, and I think incentives is why a lot of these projects fail because, you know, when, when I'm looking at crypto projects, for example, there are a lot of crypto projects that are also trying to embark on very similar goals, you know, very sort of social good missions and also have a token. And when they have that sort of pull, push pull where some people are trying to 
save the rainforest or whatever it might be. And other people are trying to optimize to get as many tokens as possible and, and get the tokens to be worth everything they can. The projects often end up just combusting yeah. because they're, they're working often at complete odds from one another. Yeah. It's like the Great Reset. Save the world and make a billion dollars. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think partly that's why Wikipedia has been successful is that people who edit Wikipedia are trying to make a better encyclopedia in some way or another. And they're not, there is really no way to make money from editing Wikipedia. People try it sometimes. They'll make these weird sort of black market, you know, mm -hmm. I'll edit your page for you. But the community in general is very resistant to that and tries to weed that out where possible. And so I think that has really helped in the formation of the community that we have today. And it is what is a barrier to so many other projects is because they do not want to separate the money from the goal. And so then I start, you know, start to wonder, well, you know, how can we enable more people to work on projects like this without having the monetary incentive? Because obviously, you know, not everyone can just spend hours a day editing Wikipedia or, you know, working on their rainforest crypto project without you know, any income or any sort of way right. to sustain themselves. And so anyway, that's that's partly sort of the rabbit hole that I've been going down. Yeah, other than I go down further that rabbit hole and I say, well, why do people need income? Why do people need a job? <laughs> you know, you only need yeah. a job, not because we need that work done. You need a job so that we can justify giving you some of the stuff that we already have in abundance anyway. Right. So, I guess UBI or something like that. If you work on Wikipedia, yeah. you should be kept alive, period. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I sort of end up at similar places. And this is, again, sort of why I see crypto as such a political thing, because people will take very different approaches to that question. You know, people will see Wikipedia and they'll go, how is it that people are able to edit Wikipedia if it's not paying them? You know, they need to feed their family, whatever it might be. There are some people who I'm sure would love to be editing Wikipedia, but just can't fit it into their schedules because they're working two jobs, they're feeding their kids, they're taking care of elderly family members, whatever it might be. How can we, you know, enable and nurture this community? And some people say, well, make a token, you know, and everyone can uh. get paid to edit and it'll be like their third job, you know, and on top of everything else, they can try to churn out as many wiki tokens as possible. And, you know, then it will be sustainable for them because they can make this income. And other people look at that and go, well, why, you know, why are why don't they have enough already? Why are they already stretched so thin? Why do they have to work two jobs? Why couldn't they work one job that right. was 20 hours a week, you know, and then they could spend the rest of their time doing whatever it was that they thought was productive and hopefully it would be beneficial to society. Maybe it wouldn't, right. but that's their, you know, right? I know, so. and at least they're having fun doing it. Like no one worries, like, how are we going to pay people to use TikTok? Right. And they're sitting on there for hours scrolling through the well, thing. Well, I'm sure like, there are some blockchain projects that are going to be block, you know, TikTok, but on the blockchain. Exactly. But, um, Anything on the blockchain is good. So I hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're not coding, yeah. right? Are you, do you code something? To some secretly? extent. I mean, you know, the Web3 is going to great project is something I built from scratch. And so I have to tinker with that from time to time. Oh, really? And, As a website. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Well, let me ask you a weird one. I don't usually ask this, but I think I have a feeling a lot of people who are listening are who are younger are thinking, how do I get to be like Molly? And I'm wondering, <laughs> what what would you suggest to a young person who's like just in college or whatever thinking, I really want to understand how all this is and be be useful and, and play in these spaces? Should they get a computer science degree, get liberal arts? Like where... What's kind of what do you feel is useful for for getting to play in these spaces in a meaningful way? I mean, I think it probably depends on people's interests. You know, people end up doing this type of stuff coming from all kinds of backgrounds. You know, I know people with CS backgrounds, I know people with econ backgrounds, with library science backgrounds. You know, it's like people from all over the place. And it, it's more about the interest and the desire to sort of chase these ideas than anything else, I think. And so, you know, my recommendation is less about like what formal degree to get, you know, get a degree or don't, whatever, you know, whatever degree makes the most sense to you. But, you know, find a community, I think, that makes sense mm. that, that you love and that you can really come to understand. You know, for me, it was the Wikimedia communities. And I feel like I'm only just realizing 
you know, now 15 years later as an adult, how formative being a Wikipedia editor was. It sounds so weird to say it, you know, but that really did end up shaping how I sort of come at the world, how I see information, you know, the importance that I ascribe to open and free knowledge, you know, the the power of online self-governing communities. And so I think everyone, you know, has something like that. And it could be something like Wikipedia, it could be an online project, or it could be, you know, a mutual aid thing in real life or, right. you know, volunteering at the animal shelter or whatever really sort of drives you. You know, I think that is what what really leads people to to things like this. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of the things you're mentioning, when I think about them, they're projects where you are incentivized to be really honest, really truthful. Like, you know, I've worked on Wikipedia for a while too. And it's like, it really made me think, God, it really matters that I'm honest here. That mm-hmm. As honest as I can be, as factual as I, you like, you don't leave anything. And if it's not, then you're like, we think, or, you know, to put it, yeah. it maybe, and just yeah. to be that totally honest, you realize, oh, wow, there is so much noise in my communication in general. It's not mm. like I'm lying, but I'm fudging. Like just in the course of a day, there's so much approximation going on, which is just adding noise rather than signal. And it really, working on something like Wikipedia, it makes you realize, no, you know, there is signal. There is actual. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's weird the sort of skills you end up picking up from Wikipedia editing. Another thing I really notice is um, media literacy Mm. is really high among Wikipedia contributors and not always so high amongst you know, people who are not evaluating sources to add to Wikipedia, you know, like I had someone ask me recently, like, you know, how reliable is the New York Post? Is it like the New York Times? (sighs) You know, and and just being able to say, oh, geez, you know, those are very different. Uh, You know, they come at things very differently. (laughs) They, you know, have a different level of fact checking. You know, it's not something that people always understand, but they'll see headlines from both of those places and they'll say, yeah, New York Post, New York Times, it's about the same, you know, and I think it is really one's left, but they're all. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, But some people don't even realize that, actually. But I Mm -hmm. think, you know, just having the ability to sort of evaluate uh, source material, be it mainstream media, be it crypto white papers, you know, and sort of pick out where people are you know, coming from a certain perspective or motivated by a certain thing. You know, I think that's also something that is pretty critical. And I sort of wish was given more attention, I guess, in today's society and maybe the educational system. I don't know, but I think it would serve people well. Yeah, it's a basic critical thinking. I mean, the more STEM we do, the more liberal arts we have to do. You know, it's like, boy, I wish. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's hard because, you know, STEM, we think of that as sort of job readiness and liberal arts, we think of as job refusal. (laughs) (laughs) The more you know, the less you want to work for these dudes. But um, (laughs) yeah. Well, cool. Well, thanks. Um, I'm first, I'm really happy that Web3 is going just great. (laughs) <laughs> and everyone can find out how great it's going by going, that's a source I trust because I trust you. You know what I mean? So I read it and feel, I and and it's it's a pleasurable feeling to read somebody who you're like, oh, right. I know they're not going to fuck with me. You know, and it's rare. <laughs> Certainly right? not intentionally. <laughs> yeah, right. It would be an accident. It would be an accident. Yeah. And you would correct it right away and apologize right. to everybody, you know, but you're also, you're you're careful. And it's like, I guess it's hard. You know, I was going to say it's not that hard to be honest, but actually it is hard to be honest. You know, it, can it be, slows, yeah. slows things down. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, especially when you're repeating other people's research, it's very tough sometimes to distinguish the truth from, you know, distortion or even just complete fabrication. And so yeah. it's definitely, you know, a lot of careful reading goes into it. <laughs> I know. Don't carefully read your friends or you'll be disappointed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's because we all, you know, we all cut corners occasionally. I mean, I'm trying to do as little of that as possible, but I write opinion stuff. So it's, yeah. it's kind of what corner am I going to cut other than, you know, being afraid to speak truth to power. But um, <laughs> you're speaking great truth to power and having great, uh, I'm hoping great fun. It, the, the fun reads through the lines of what you're doing. And it makes me feel way more hopeful because even in these failures, they're spectacular failures that you're writing about, you know, and it's like, it's kind of, oh, I get where they went wrong. And I feel bad for people who lost money. But on the other hand, it's like, oh, come on. 
it'll be fine. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you so much for what you do and, uh, and for being on Team Human and for engendering trust rather than substituting for it between us little, little sad little people. <laughs> it means a lot. Thank you for having me. And thank you for being on Team Human. You can find out more about Molly White at mollywhite.com as well as web3isgoinggreat.com. You can find out more about Molly and all of our guests by going to teamhuman.fm where you can also become a supporting member of the team. Team Human is produced by Joshua Chapdelin and edited by Luke Robert Mason. I'm Douglas Rushka, and you've been on Team Human, our last best hope for peeps. Peace.